Ruiz. Funkateers, Bootsy here to bring the Truth and Rhythm family's attention to Funk Not Fight. Yeah, this is a call to action. We spread hope, not hate, uh, to gain satisfaction throughout our communities via the music uplifting unity. Uh, Peppermint Patty, tell us a little more. Thinker is our partner. Thinker music, that is. So please check the link that's scrolling across the bottom, click it, and submit your music. Let's all funk, funk not, not fight. fight. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm. Brought to you by funkandstuff.net, this is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. I'm delighted to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership RV singer and composer Melissa Morgan. Releasing her first six albums in 1986, she saw three of her first four LPs ascend to the RB Top 40. Those records included eight top 20 RB hits, among them the number one Prince Penn Smash, Do Me Baby, as well as Do You Still Love Me? If You Can Do It, I Can Too. The Mother's Finest Classic, Love Changes, and the Al Green remake, Still in Love With You. Along the way, she collaborated with Paul Lawrence, Kashif, James J.T. Taylor, and Freddie Jackson. She has come out of the pandemic, the pandemic lull, I should say, swinging big time with her most successful track in some time. It's called Footprints of an Angel, and it marries mournful lyrics with an upbeat tempo, a catchy Motown-informed melody, and an inspired vocal performance. Up for Grammy consideration is from the feature film of the same name, in which she also co-stars. All right, Melissa, thank you for joining the show. How are you? Hi, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> How are you feeling today? I'm feeling really, really good. Um, uh, as you can see, we, we're just chilling, you know, we're in South Carolina. And uh, just, uh, we're getting ready to go to Charlotte for the day. Uh, on this weekend, so I'm excited. <laughs> well, the Carolinas, you know, I'm just north of Charlotte. Get out of here. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I've owned a place in uh, South Carolina for 
uh, over 20 years now, my family left it to me and uh, we just renovated and we come down here and we enjoy the weather and the, the good air. And I spent the whole pandemic down here. Yes. All right. Well, I've been out here since 06 from Los Angeles, so I love it. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it's really, I, I think this is the best uh, fresh air we're going to get. <laughs> Yeah, well, hopefully that tropical storm's not going to do any harm coming up there. I, I hope not. Uh, we're, we're, like I said, we're going to North Carolina for the day. If it, if it does anything, we'll stay an extra day. Yeah. All right. Well, great. Well, I'm so glad you could join the show, and uh, I know viewers are going to really appreciate it. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. So, uh, Melissa, I know you're from Queens originally, which, gosh, is such a hotbed of incredible R&B and, and jazz and, and even hip-hop. You sang in the church choir, I understand. What was it like for you um, growing up, and how did music become so central for you? It, it was really, um, it was a backbone of, of, of my family. People, you know, in, in my whole family, they always went to music, you know, for happiness, and and we they partied a lot. My my. My parents, my aunts, my uncles, they did what they call a round robin. They went from house to house every weekend, you know, so it would be at my Aunt Lena's house one weekend and at my auntie's house another weekend or at our house another weekend. And, and music was always something that, that made people happy. I always see music break up fights, <laughs> all kind of stuff. Music made people happy. And, and my my mother, you know, she loved to sing and she loved to plant. And uh, we lived across the street from the church, uh, Mount Horror uh, Baptist Church. And she would send us to church every Sunday, whether she went or not. And uh, the, the whole uh, church community just got used to, you know, us being there, Sunday school and everything. And, and then when it came time, you know, for me to uh, join a choir, uh, they just said, uh, you know, take Melissa over there. My mother, she really didn't mind because uh, she just wanted to get me out of the house for the weekend. So <laughs> rehearsals were good for her. But uh, music was always something that we did. Me and my sister, we sang Aretha Franklin, The Temptations, you know, all that stuff. We sang that at home all the time. Wow. And when did you think, wow, maybe I could make a career out of this? You know, how old were you? Um, I, I want to say I was about 14, about 14 or 15. And it was the, the choir that, that made me realize that because it wasn't a, a normal choir. The Starless of Corona was a choir that was a community choir. So we didn't belong to one church. So we went around to different churches in the community and in Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. We went around singing at different churches and we were in um, uh, choir competitions and, and all that stuff. So after the choir broke up, when I was about like 14 years old, I knew that I wanted to be a singer. Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't nervous in front of people doing it? You felt natural? Oh, I was I was totally nervous. The first time I, I sang, I started crying. I sang a song called I Must Tell Jesus. And I started like bawling because I was so nervous. But it turned out to be a showstopper because seeing a little nine year old girl singing, I must tell Jesus and crying. It was like, oh, Lord, she's got the spirit, you know. <laughs> so, you know, it became a showstopper. And I, I, I would sing that song at the end and win some of the competitions that we were in because, uh, you know, it, it, it was just an emotional thing. Yeah. Wow. And I understand, you know, uh, Shaka Khan was an influence and who isn't. I mean, she's like my favorite of all time. Um, who else were some of your, your big influences and heroes? Well, I, I, I have to say Aretha. You know, Aretha Franklin was the first. I think I, I sang an Aretha Franklin song first before I sang anyone. Um, then you go, you know, after that, we went to the Supremes because uh, uh, everybody wanted to do the steps. And, you know, we all wanted to be a size uh, a zero, zero like them. Because <laughs> back then it was zero, zero. Who knows what they are now with the booties and everything. But uh, <laughs> back then, you wanted to be as small as you can. And we always admired the Supremes and Diana Ross. Mm -hmm. And what would you say was your sort of big break to get into a, a group that, you know, got some attention, you know, well before your solo stuff? Um, 
I would sing at the cellar with um, Johnny Kim and uh, wonderful people like that. And, and artists like the Isley Brothers and Patti LaBelle, they would come to the cellar when they were in New York and come and see us. Uh, so, um, and they would tell people, you know, about us. So uh, I want to say my, my biggest break was singing a song called uh, Keep in Touch Body to Body because being with Johnny Kemp and being at the cellar, people would call us to, to, for sessions. They would call us to sing backgrounds on, on uh, records and stuff like that. And a gentleman named Patrick Adams who had that big song, Push, Push in the Bush, you know. I don't remember the group, but I remember the song. Um, he called us to do a session and we did this song called Body to Body and the lead singer didn't show up. And um, he was like, well, if one of your background singers can uh, do the song, you know, I'll pay you extra for the session, $75. <laughs> can you believe that? I can't, every time I think about that, it's, it's crazy. But anyway, I, I was the one who could sing that high. And uh, I, I wound up singing a song called Body to Body the lead to it. And it came out like a week or two later and went number one dance. And that was like my biggest break before the solo career. And was that uh, at Shades of Love or was that um, High Fashion? or Shades of Love. Shades of Love was before High Fashion. Yes. Um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, High Fashion. I could talk a little bit about that. But anyway, Shades of Love was before High Fashion. I went out and and, and did it as the lead singer of Shades of Love because the group they wanted me to sing with, you know, it, it wasn't for me. The girls couldn't sing. They wanted, a, you know, the look, but they couldn't sing. So, so I left them and worked that. And then Petrus, yeah, Fred Petrus came to New York and took over the, the recording scene. He, he was hiring every background singer, every musician, every uh, um, studio singer, and he was putting them on records. And the records were, were, were coming out and going number one and being famous. It was Change. And then uh, after Change, it was a, a gentleman named Timmy Allen who played bass uh, with Change. And he told me, he said, you ought to, you know, think about uh, hiring Melissa Morgan and Allison Williams, you know, because they can sing. And Allison had already, she was already doing stuff with Petrus. And then I came in and he formed the group uh, High Fashion. Yeah, there's some heavyweights right there. I mean, Patrick and, um, and you know, the Change situation. Uh, Timmy Allen's been on the show, so we talked quite a bit about. Yes. I mean, he, he did so many things over the years with his bass playing incredible oh gosh and a, a great a great songwriter and 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 a good person to be with in the studio because he allows you to do your thing while he's monitoring that's what i say you're monitoring me timmy he's like yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> he seems pretty easy going but he's you know i think um deceptively like dialed in right Yes, yes, yes. You know, and uh, uh, we we were just so proud of him. I think he's in in Philly now. We were so proud of him when he did the Joe song and everything. And and uh, I used to, um, I still love her, uh, a gospel singer named uh, Vanessa Bell Armstrong. He got to do a, a session with her, and he called me immediately. But I was out of town. I was like, Oh my God, I'm gonna miss the session with Vanessa Bell Armstrong. And he says, I I wish I could wait for you. So he good person. Yeah. <laughs> So do you remember uh, first hearing something you were involved with on the radio or maybe it was in a club or how that? Oh, oh, well, I think Body to Body. Yeah. I mean, I heard some of the background stuff, but uh, Body to Body was uh, uh, one of the biggest. And, and I was actually working at Chase Manhattan Bank. <laughs> um, I was an executive secretary. Yeah, I, I was making $25 an hour long before, you know, uh, people now. I was making $25 an hour as an executive secretary at Chase Manhattan Bank, just coming fresh out of high, sc high school. Yeah. And um, uh, somebody said, you know, your, your record is on, on the radio. And I, I was like, what are you talking about? And, and it was the um, Don, Don Hamilton, who did the session with me, he had heard it and he called me. He said, your record is on the radio. And I was like, what are you talking about my record? He was like, the Shades of Love record is on the radio. So I was running around Chase Manhattan trying to find somebody who had a, a, a radio. 
Because, you know, you wasn't allowed to have that stuff. But there was one girl in the mail room that had a radio and we turned on to WBLS and it was playing. Yeah. Wow. 25 an hour. That beats 75 for a recording session. It does. <laughs> yeah. I was like, I, I'm not doing this recording thing. I ain't making no money. I only did it on the weekends, but I made more money with Johnny Kemp and them and Timmy and them with the group uh, when we did the cellar, but we had to play like two, three shows a night. Yeah. Yeah. And we made $75 a night, Friday, Saturday, you know, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. Did you have any experiences uh, going on the road at all before you got your solo deal, you know, performing, traveling at all? Not not really. Uh, um, uh, Johnny Kent, we would do things like upstate or something like that with uh, like the alumni, the schools and stuff like that. But not really, not too much traveling besides what I did, you know, with the community quite going to Washington and Philadelphia. Yeah. And did, did Johnny have his big hit at that point yet or that was still to come? No. Oh, no, we were all we were all musicians in in New York, you know, coming up. We had we had it was a Johnny Kemp band and we played the cellar and um, uh, we played McKell's and Under the Stairs and all that stuff. And and Timmy was in the group and Johnny and and myself. And it, it was a wonderful time. Uh, uh, who else was the, the guitar player, too? Oh, I'll think of his name in a minute. It'll come to me. Yeah. He passed away. Oh, Mike Campbell on guitar yeah just all those wonderful musicians yeah did you do any originals or just all covers um we did originals uh then you know later on uh like i said timmy wrote stuff for me but uh during that time we were doing uh covers yeah so what were the steps that led to you getting that solo deal eventually uh, let's see i had uh toured with uh with Kashif, uh, we, we um, Kashif was was doing his thing, and and he had all all his. I sang background on a lot of stuff with Kashif, the Whitney Houston stuff, um, his stuff, some of the other stuff that he was doing for other artists. So when he went out on the road, he asked me to come out on the road and be like the featured. Uh, female singer to sing like the Evelyn Champagne King stuff. I'm in love and all that. And so I did that. And um, while I was singing with him, uh, we were supposed to do a show with Gladys Knight. It got canceled and then it wind up um, getting back on the books, but they took it to Broadway. And so we did two nights on Broadway with Gladys Knight with Kashif opening. And that, that was a wonderful gig. And at that time, he had uh, the management company, Hush Productions, that was um, Melba Moore's um, ex-husband and Melba Moore running the company. And they had signed Freddie Jackson. They had signed Lilo. They had Kashi, And they had some, some other artists. And um, uh, uh, the first night, no, it was the second night. The second night that we opened for Gladys, we were all backstage, and, you know, just chilling and happy about, oh, wow, we opened for Gladys on Broadway. Um, uh, Charles Huggins came up to me and he said, uh, well, you sang behind Shaka, you sang with Kashif, you sang on, on everyone's session. Don't you think it's time for you to do your solo thing? And I was like, Are you sure, I'd love to if somebody give me a deal. And he literally said, come into the office tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. And it was on 58th Street in Manhattan. And literally, they signed me right on the spot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it was no, let's go back and forth. They literally signed me right on the spot and said, you're going to have a deal with Capitol Records. You know, we're going to do an album on you. And we're going to pay you this amount of money advance and blah, blah, blah. Are you ready to go? Because we're ready to get started like within the next two weeks. And I was like, sure. You know, and, and I had a, a lawyer named Kendall Mentor. I don't even think we, you know, I don't even think we did no real negotiation with that. Kendall was like, get in the business, get your feet wet. Let's go. Let's just do it. And anything that comes up, we'll fix it later. <laughs> yeah. See to your pants. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and that was like around 1985. Yeah, that was uh, that was probably like eighty four because it took us uh, it took us about a a year 
to do the album. It took us about a year, give or take. So I want to say either early, like February 84 or late, eight, no, I'm sorry, February 85 or late 84. Because by, um, gosh, by October, September, October, we had the first single. Yeah, yeah. Now, did you always have uh, visions and aspirations of being a solo act, or did you think you would mostly be more of a, you know, a background singer or, or what? Well, once once I started, you know, doing the stuff with Johnny Kemp and the Shockers started calling me and doing the stuff with Kashif, it, it became more clear that you, you, you just can't stay in the background. Yeah, because people are seeing you as a forefront. You know, so it, it became clearer to me that that I would have to go to the next level. Yeah. And now you also did other things, at least you're credited for other musical things, you know, over your career, whether it's arranging or, you know, certainly songwriting and even a little mm -hmm. keyboard here or there. Um, how how did you pick those things up? Well, I, I don't really play keyboards, you know. No, uh, uh, no I, I don't really play. This is an instrument, even though I understand all instruments. But what happened is that uh, uh, dur during, during the time, like right after, um, I want to say right after Doobie Baby and stuff came out, I, I, went, I went back to... Um, I went to Lee Strasberg school to learn how to get over my fears. But before that, I went to Juilliard. I went to Juilliard and studied music theory because I wanted to learn chordal structure and how notes and stuff worked with musical instruments because we were singing things that we knew, oh, well, this go with this and, you know, sing this and that's right. And it was like, but well, why is it right? You know, so I went to the Juilliards and studied music theory to learn why it's right, why this one third goes with that third and this chord doesn't go with that chord, you know, and there's only, you know, 12 notes in, in the whole music, you know, uh, 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 um, life, you know, saying that there's nothing else, you know, and yeah. it's like, well, there's, there's nothing else besides these two. Nope. And you have to make all of these work. That's it. And it's just a variation of these notes and these chords and nothing else works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, credit to you for going back and, and doing that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> uh, now, Kashif, um, what can you tell us uh, about him in terms of what was he like as just a person? And what, what about his talent? Oh, my God. Because she was, 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 was a fun person to be around because he always wanted to share the knowledge. He was, there, there are some people that you're around that they, they, they know what they're doing, but they don't want you to know what they're doing. He was never, ever like that. He always wanted you to know, hey, Melissa, come check out this new, you know, this new keyboard I got, this in Clavier. Let me show you what it does. You know, and it does this, and I'm going to put your voice in there, and then, you know, you'll understand what it is. Hey, Melissa, that note sounds good, but you know what? We probably need about 16 more, more notes in here. This is what we're going to do. Come in here. Let me show you what we're going to do. We're going to put 16 different voices of you on this, and then we're going to put them all together. He, he was just like that. He was a wonderful person to be around. He always wanted to share his wealth, and he always wanted to share his knowledge, and I appreciated him for that. Um. And of course, his you know success speaks for itself. Yes. Um, what was it that uh, one or two things maybe that you picked up or learned from doing the background stuff with some of the you know great singers you mentioned that you were able to kind of bring into your own solo career? Oh, that that's an interesting question. Um, um, sing well. I I know singing background. You have to be. Um, in unison with yourself. And, and that's one of the things I learned. And, and, and a lot of my records, because of that, I don't have a lot of background singers on my record. I did most of the background stuff myself because I learned how to be in unison and in sync with myself. And, and that's really hard to do sometimes with other people. That's why the, the Sweet Inspirations and the Jones Girls and stuff like that, once you get that, that chemistry, you, you don't want to let it go, um, in, 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 and rightfully so. But in the later years, 
with Kashif and people like that, I learned how to sing with myself and not need, you know, other people. So um, that that was that was one of the lessons I learned. But bringing it to to my my lead stuff, hmm. I just want to say that a lot of times when I sang uh, background and stuff, I would do like little inflictions and affectations that are in my voice. And people would say, don't do that. Don't do that. That's what a lead singer does. <laughs> don't do that. You know, sing it straight. Sing it straight. And, and, and I would always be like, why do you have to sing it so straight? But sing it straight. Don't do it like that. You know, because then you're not going to be in harmony with the other people. So I just think, you know, me wanted to, to fly and not sing things so straight. That helped me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the background, you got to dumb it down a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, what was the experience like when you got in the studio and, and worked on that first album? I mean, what do you remember about those sessions? Oh, gosh. Well, um, there's uh, two things. Two things I remember. Um, I remember because I had went out on the road with the set and, and we had toured with Shaka Khan. When we left Shaka Khan, we decided, well, hey, if something happened, you know what I'm saying? Cause she had did Funky for Jamaica with Tom uh, Brown and all of that. So, so me and Lisette Wilson was on the road with Shaka Khan. I sang background and Lisette Wilson was a musical director for Shaka Khan. But Lisette Wilson is one of the writers on Funkin' for Jamaica with Tom Brown that he did with Tony Smith. So when me and Lisette left Shaka, you know, cause Shaka went on and, you know, we're like, okay, what are we gonna do? <laughs> we're no longer, she's no longer musical director with Shaka and I'm no longer singing background. It was like, well, when I, if I get a record deal, you know what I'm saying? Then I'll make sure that I'll come back to you and we start writing songs together for that. And so that's what we did. When I got my deal with Capital, uh, Hush Productions allowed me and Lisette to just go and write songs and bring it back to them. And Lisette had a, like a little studio in her basement. So she would go during the day and write music, right? She would do all the music and, you know, cause that's what she was good at. And then, at night, she would say, okay, come on in and put your vocals and your backgrounds. And she showed me how to do everything. So then I would go in and, and lay my backgrounds and, and do my lead and, and my melody and, and all of that stuff and come up with, you know, what the song was going to be. And then we would take that to Hush Productions and let them hear it. And that's, that's the process that we did for Do Me Baby. And they picked the songs that they liked. And how did you decide upon that title track, you know, um, giving that female perspective to that Prince classic? Oh, now that I had nothing to do with. <laughs> what happened with that was um, when when Hush Productions signed me, um, I got on the phone and, and, and said hello to the president of Capitol Records. And his name was Don Grierson. And Don Grierson said, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to you being on Capitol Records. We're going to have a great time. But there's one song that you have to do. And we was like, well, well, that's weird for a president to say that. He said, but there's one song you have to do because I've had this song on hold for two years and my time is up. And the next female R&B artist that I signed has got to do this record. And it's you. And I said, OK, what song is it? And he said, Do Me Baby by Prince. And we were like, do me, baby, by Prince. I'm like 18 and a half, 19. I don't want to do, <laughs> I don't want to do that nasty song. This sounds like a nasty song. But I loved Prince, though. You know, we we all in New York, we would go see him at the bottom line and, and just everywhere he performed when he was first coming out with Andre Simone and the plastic pants. And, you know, we, we just loved Prince. So uh, I was like, okay, let me hear the record. When I heard the record, I was like, oh my God, my father's going to kill me. So, um, you know, I told my father about it and I let him hear the song. He was like, well, baby girl, you can sing the song. Go in there and sing the hell out of it and make it a hit. And they got Paul Lawrence to uh, produce it. And uh, it turned out to be, you know, like one of my biggest songs. I mean, now to sing Do Me Baby is nothing, but in 
1985. Come on. <laughs> it was like a woman singing that, you know, you know, kiss me all over, play with my love. <laughs> you know, now that's nothing compared to what Cardi B says. <laughs> yeah. That's right. But uh, it brought you out of your shell a little bit, huh? Yes, it did. It did. <laughs> I, I had I had to stand on it. And it's a funny thing because, you know, I had sang with uh, Whitney Houston, of course. I sang because um, she produced a couple of tracks on her first album. So I was able to sing and meet her. And so, of course, they both came out around the same time. And I'm in New Orleans. I'll tell you this story. I'm in New Orleans. You know Bourbon Street, right? Mm -hmm. So we walked down Bourbon Street, my first time in New Orleans. I'm so excited, you know, playing music all over the street. So we're here, you know, when he's, oh, I want to dance with somebody. I want to feel my heat. We're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden we hear Doobie Baby. It was like, oh, my God, we hear Doobie Baby. And then we look up and there's like this lady dressed all scantily. <laughs> so I'm like, come up, <laughs> you know, come up, you know, invite guys and come up. Oh my God. So they play Whitney Houston in the street and they play me in the little, you know, <laughs> the house of ill repute. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, <laughs> well, from my standpoint, though, you know, I was always a Prince fan from the very beginning. Uh, but with a song like Doobie Baby, it was like, I appreciate it for what it was. It was a good song. But it was only so deep I could get into it from a male perspective. Yeah. Know? So for me, it was nice to hear a female sing it. Yeah, yeah. Everyone, well, it, it stayed number one for like four weeks. So everyone really enjoyed that uh, perspective that I gave to it. And with Paul Lawrence production, it was, it, it really turned out really good. It's a song that I love doing. And um, to this day, when I do it, I don't even have to sing it. You know, the audience just sings it for me. It's a wonderful thing. And did you ever meet Prince? Oh, several times. Actually, I met him, you know, I, I seen him like a month before he passed away. Yeah, because he was uh, producing um, the group, uh, well, the musicians that, it, that went on the road with him. He had an album coming out with them and they invited me, you know, to the showcase to hear, you know, the album. And um, I spoke to him. He was actually there with uh, Tamara Hall. Uh, the young lady uh, from the uh, talk show, he was there with her and we talked for a minute and I told him I wanted to come and see him live because I hadn't seen him, you know, perform live in, in a long time. And he said, we're going to make that happen, Melissa. And, you know, then a month later, he passed away. Yeah, I know he was notoriously critical of versions of his songs. Did he ever, like, give you any feedback? <laughs> yes, he told me, thank you. Thank you for uh, a great song. And I said, a great song. It's your song. You wrote it. He said, yeah, but you made it great. Wow. Well, that's that serious nice. praise from him because he didn't yeah. do that much. He didn't. And he, he would he would take me out on the road. He would take Shaka and everybody else. He would take me out on the road. He said, you know, maybe I'm too much competition. <laughs> wow. So uh, aside from that song, how did you feel about how the album came out overall? Were you really happy with it? Um, you know, oh, yeah. 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 We were really, really happy with it. Unfortunately, uh, we're still trying trying to get that rectified. We didn't get a goal. I didn't get a goal album because, you know, at like 400 and something like 450, 485 copies, everything turned to sound scan. And I, I'm still fighting you know, with um, with Capital and South Skin, RIAA, to get uh, Do Me Baby certified go. Wow. Yeah. Well, man, talk about overdue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Way. Yeah. Well, they had four singles on it. So that's, you know, a lot. The record yeah. company is definitely supporting you nicely on that one. Um, one track that wasn't a single, though, is Lies, which I thought was a real nice da dance track. Yeah, yeah, um, Royal Band, yeah, um, that, that was a really good one, and and a lot of people don't know that Fool's Paradise did not do well as a single release on that at all, I think, I don't know if it was in the 20s or 30s, I don't know what it did, it just turned out that Fool's Paradise became a, a New York hit, 
for some reason, New York Radio gravitated to that song and they did not let go. And they, the whole country then got a hold of it and then, international, and then internationally, it's like an anthem over in the UK. They did not let that song go, but it did not do well on the charts. Yeah. Huh. It's funny, when I first saw that, uh, and associated with you and knowing you had done some work with Shock, I thought maybe it was a remake of the Rufus Fool's Paradise, but of course it's not. It's totally different. But you know what? It, 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 it's not a remake of it, but that was the inspiration. Okay. Yeah, from being on the road with Shaka. She never did that song. And that was one of my favorite songs. I was like, why don't you ever do Fool Stars? I didn't do that song. It's like, oh my God, I love that song, you know? And she she, we, she never did it on the road. And so it, it was kind of like a homage, it's like, well, I'm going to do it and, 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 and fix it up and make it better. So, you know what I'm saying? People can see the perspective of, of what it is because everyone thinks Fool's Paradise is about something else and fool's paradise really is about a parent talking to their their child before they go out on their own and it's it, you know i don't know what people think fool's paradise, but it's it's telling them you know don't go out there and get caught up in the fool's paradise because if you do i'll be here waiting for you when you come off your trip mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's good good advice right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I have a list here. So I made it to 24. Yeah. 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 Or do, do You Still Love Me hit number five. So. Yeah, that, that was a good one. And thank God I was a co-writer. I still get money from that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's. That's one that they love. That's a, that's a ballad that they love. And it's it's so strange, you know, even now when I come out with something, they're always, you know, comparing it to that. And it's like, you've got to you got to let that go, people. It's already out there. You know what I'm saying? You've got to embrace who I am today. So and that's a very hard thing for fans. Very hard thing. And for the music industry, you know, especially radio. Yeah, it's hard. So what did you do differently for your follow-up album? You know, um, what lessons did you learn and bring into that? And how did you, you know, change things up? There wasn't much to learn when we went into the sophomore after Do Me Baby because it had done so well. You see what I said? So the, the, the thing that they wanted, Capital and Hush and everyone, they just wanted to repeat the same thing. So we would have just as much success. Um, uh, so, so music wise, I, I think we hit it on the nail. I think what, ha what happened with, um, uh, the follow-up, uh, good love, uh, was, um, the business. Then you start learning about the business of the industry. And I think that's when it starts. Okay. Well, you know, I don't want that same 10,000 that you gave me when I was in the office the first time, I, you know, so I, and you were supposed to do this and that was supposed to get done. And where's my money from this? And with that's, that's what got all confused with it. Yeah. Yeah. So the honeymoon was over a little bit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, but I thought overall that album uh, just seemed like it was more, a little more assured, you know, like, just like, you were like more of a seasoned pro, you know, by that one, I felt, you know? Okay. Yeah, yeah. musically, like like I said, the first one had did so well. So we did we we wasn't changing anything. We was just getting better at it. So yeah, yeah that that's where we were. When we went in the studio this time, it didn't take us, you know, two or three days to do it. It's like, okay, let's get in here, do it, get on out, you know, and sa save some money. So um yeah, we, we were a little bit more seasoned with what we were doing, exactly. And it was more up-tempo. Um, and uh, If You Can Do It, I Can Too was a real sort of Jody Watley, Janet Jackson kind of thing that was going on then. Well, If You Can Do It, I Can Do It wasn't really like my favorite, but I wanted to do something with Paul Lawrence again. You know, I, I, I felt he, he deserved that after Do Me Baby. There's no if and so and that so he said, This is this is it, Melissa. This is what you need to do. So I just went with his expertise. Yeah. Well, it was kind of like the type of material they were doing, but you could blow the doors off them vocally. So you know Yeah. Yeah. 
and I I love them all, Jody and Janet and all. I really love them. But then they're, they're they're not they're not the same type of singers. Yeah. <laughs> they they dance better than I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Things really changed in the eighties, moving toward that way, yeah. away from the singing so much, for sure. Um and here comes the night, real good uh, mid tempo track. Yeah, with 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 Tashif, yeah, mm -hmm. that was uh, that was his his uh, production with with the people on his team. Yes, and good love to me was strikes me like a little bit like a ain't nobody kind of thing, you know, that Shaka. Which one? Done. Which good one? Good love. Oh, good love. Oh, yeah. Um, Everyone loved the 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 drive of of Lisette's, uh piano playing. They just loved how when it, it, even live when she played live, she just you know she bang on those 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 pianos. And so we just wanted something that was more driven with her you know with her style of piano playing because no one was doing that and so that's where that came because usually do 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 that would be a bass line is it on the boom go do go do go you know and we was like nah don't make it a bass line play it because she played so hard you know what i'm saying it's so so precise it was like play it and when she played it was like that's what we're talking about yeah what were your shows like at that time? Awesome. We went out with Freddie. We went out with uh, Billy Ocean. Uh, when Keith Sweat came on the scene, you know, he had to get Melissa Morgan, you know, uh, uh, Levert. It was, it was wonderful. Now, I do want to say a lot, a lot of females wouldn't let me open for them. No females, no, like, Gladys Knight, like Aretha, and still to this day they know. Patty LaBelle. Yeah, Patty LaBelle is the only one that came through and said, "Okay, I'm gonna let you open for me." But it was like years later. Yeah, and we went to to Europe, and she and they said we want to put Melissa on the show. Put Melissa on the show because I've been promising her that I'm gonna let her be on, you know, open for me, you know. But a lot of female um, artists don't don't want me on the show. <laughs> wow, bring, bring yeah. too much heat. You know, uh, Freddie Jackson said that to me one time. I was like, well, Freddie, well, how, you know, we went out on the road and we did a couple of shows. That, you know, then later on during the years, it's like, you know, hey, why don't we do a, 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 a you know, a tour together? Have to work too hard when you're on the show. <laughs> Have to work too hard after you open. So, uh, I don't know, you yeah. know. But I, I'm never going to stop doing what I do. So it is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.